In 1963, detectives investigated the murder of a woman in California. But it would take technology almost 30 years to catch up with the killer. A trash bag is the only clue detectives have to the identity of a serial killer. So far, their search has met only with failure. But a new fingerprint technology will give them one last chance to put the killer away. In a murder investigation in Vermont, police have their suspect. Now all they need is solid evidence to convict him. The case hinges on a bloody but distorted palm print on the murder weapon. In cases that look all but hopeless, science finds a solution in the telltale marks of the killer's death grip. In 1985, a serial killer was on the loose in San Diego, California. The killer targeted prostitutes and other women. He'd rape and murder them, then discard their bodies in trash dumpsters. To catch him, police needed to identify his fingerprints, which proved to be elusive. On the morning of May 9, 1986, police responded to a call from a woman who came upon a ghastly sight as she was taking out her garbage, the killer's latest victim. When they arrived, they saw a sight that had become all too familiar, a body in a dumpster. This time, the murderer had wrapped it in two garbage bags joined with masking tape. After disposing of the body in the dumpster, he covered it with a blanket. Police questioned neighbors to find out if they'd seen anyone suspicious. No one had seen anything out of the ordinary. Homicide detectives came to the scene to investigate. An emergency unit arrived to retrieve the body. The victim was identified as Joanne Sweets, a prostitute. She had been raped and strangled to death, and several of her ribs were broken. That was the serial killer's calling card. Would the killer elude police again? It was going to be a tough case to crack. Since most of the victims were prostitutes, the murders weren't always reported, or the few eyewitnesses were unreliable. But this time, the detectives were able to lift a fingerprint from the dumpster. Detective Dan Hatfield was part of a task force formed to stop the horrid wave of killings before it went any further. Primarily, uh, the whole focus of the, uh, the task force was to look into uh, women, primarily prostitutes, that. Uh, had uh, been found murdered here in the city of San Diego and also in the county. There was approximately 35 to 40 unsolved cases. The Joanne Sweets case was the latest. With any luck, it would be the last. Detectives believe the killer lived or worked in the neighborhood. Two other prostitutes' bodies had also been discovered in dumpsters nearby. We had Tara Simpson that was found in, the, uh, in another dumpster that's adjacent to, uh, to the Joanne Sweets case. Uh, the dumpster was located at the T of the, uh, the alley. Um, the early morning hours, the uh, police were called here. Uh, they found the uh, garbage container fully engulfed. The fire department finds that there's a female in there and she is badly burned. A lot of the evidence was lost because of the, uh, the fact that she was badly burned. Several months after, Tara Simpson's uh, body was found here. We go up several blocks up the same alleyway um, at another dumpster was uh, found the body of Trina Carpenter.
Katrina Carpenter uh, had also been manually strangled. Um, she was wrapped in a uh, green duffel bag at that time. Hatfield was sure the same man was behind the deaths of all the women. But the investigation turned up no suspects. A manual search of fingerprints in police files failed to match the print found on the dumpster where Sweet's body was found. Whoever left the print didn't have a criminal record. The case went unsolved. Three years later, fingerprint expert Diane Donnelly joined the task force to work on the Joanne Sweets case. I was brought in on this case in 1989 at the request of homicide and this is one of the cases that they had asked to go back and re-examine some of the evidence to see if there was anything else we could do at this point. She learned that fingerprint experts had already tried using a chemical called gentian violet to lift prints from the masking tape that held the garbage bags around the body. The process can expose fingerprints left on sticky surfaces. When a finger touches the adhesive side of tape and is removed, skin cells remain behind. The gentian violet stains those cells, revealing the print. Experts repeated the process over and over but couldn't raise a single print. Then, shortly after Donnelly joined the task force, she and San Diego detectives received a break. They decided to make another attempt to identify the print from the dumpster using a new computerized fingerprint matching system. Several suspects were considered and dismissed before a match was made. The prints belonged to a man named Brian Maurice Jones. At the time of the San Diego murders, he'd never been arrested. Since then, Jones had been convicted for rape, robbery, and kidnapping a prostitute. He became the prime suspect in the murder of Joanne Sweets. But detectives knew the print from the dumpster wasn't enough to make a case. Jones would have an alibi. His mother lived in a building adjacent to the alley where Sweet's body had been found. And of course you could logically assume that his defense would be that he had taken out his mother's trash. So we needed something more concrete, that proverbial nail in the coffin, to link him to this murder and maybe some of the other murders of the, of, of the women in San Diego. Even without a print, Dan Hatfield had a strong hunch that Jones had murdered Joanne Sweets and the others. According to Hatfield's scenario, Jones most likely cruised the boulevard looking for victims. He'd pick a prostitute and take her to his mother's apartment while she was at work. He'd act like a typical client, but the evening would culminate in murder. Afterward, he'd wrap the body up and take it out to the dumpster, like he was taking out the trash. Jones was still in prison for lesser crimes, but he'd be eligible for parole in 10 years. If Hatfield could link him to the Joanne Sweets murder, he'd make sure Jones would never get out. I believe when Mr. Jones dumped Joanne Sweets' body in the dumpster, he probably felt he could get away with it since he got away with the other two murders. In their effort to prove Jones's guilt, the detectives would pin their hopes on the latest method of fingerprint technology. Stalled for three years, the murder investigation of Joanne Sweets got a jump start in 1992. Detectives once again focused on the garbage bags the killer used to wrap his victim. Six years earlier, no prints were found on the bags. But Dan Hatfield and Diane Donnelly were sure the prints were there. 
At the time that I was investigating these cases, it was my feeling that there were in fact latent prints on the garbage bags. We were just not using the right technique. I checked around, I talked with the FBI. What they told me is that there was a technique that was being used in England and also in Canada with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, a technique called vacuum metal deposition. At which point I called Canada I found out that they were in fact using this technique to lift latent prints from uh, plastics and that they were more than happy to do our case. Donnelly took the evidence to the laboratories of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in Ottawa. She was hopeful, but the prints were six years old. Would they have degraded too much for the process to work? They were more than willing and happy to assist me in this matter, but they were not too optimistic about obtaining any identifiable latent prints. The process, known as vacuum metal deposition, was developed in the U.S., but most jurisdictions don't have the money to utilize it. It's used more widely in Europe and Canada. Its main application is on plastics. But for fingerprint expert Pat Laternus of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, it's a versatile process that works when all other techniques have failed. Uh, it's possible to get fingerprints on things like magazine paper, uh, paper towel, uh, tissue, very fine uh, uh, exhibits. Uh, it has a limited application in some of those things, but really, when there's no other way to do it, and it works. Uh, if we take uh, uh, the best exhibit, the uh, uh, solid plastic type of exhibit, it's a matter of keeping that clean and then placing it inside the work holder of, of the chamber. Handling the evidence carefully, Laternus places it in the chamber. A few milligrams of gold are deposited on a heating element. Once the chamber is sealed, pumps create a vacuum. Once it's within a vacuum, the gold source is heated, and that heat is melting the metal. The metal would almost liquefy, boil, and then uh, you can compare it to steam where it, where it would go straight up and condense it on the surface that it hits. A thin, invisible layer coats the plastic surface of the garbage bag. If the bag contains no fingerprints, the layer of gold will be uniform. But if fingerprints are present, the gold will sink into them, leaving the oily ridges of the print uncoated. The process is then repeated with a few milligrams of zinc. Like the gold, the zinc vaporizes within the evidence chamber. It will recondense only onto other metals so it will only cling to the previous layer of gold. But the zinc won't stick on the oily residue of the fingerprint where there's no gold. The result is a high contrast fingerprint. The bags were removed from the chamber and inspected. This moment would make or break the case against Jones. After six years in hiding, the prints on the bags finally became visible. And with them, a dead-end case cleared a major roadblock. We knew this exhibit was six years old. We knew it was involved in a homicide, which made it a high-profile case. And uh, it was quite exciting to see the latent when we pulled it out of the chamber. The latent prints found on the garbage bags matched the prints of Brian Maurice Jones. The vacuum metal deposition process enabled Hatfield and Donnelly to connect him to the murder. The nail in the casket were in fact the latent prints that were taken from the garbage bags and that came back matching Brian Jones without a doubt. Um, there was no way for him to disprove the fact that these were somebody else's prints. Um, that was a nail in the coffin as far as I'm concerned. In 1996, the state of California tried Brian Maurice Jones for the murder of Joanne Sweets and several related crimes. 
he was convicted and sentenced to death. Advances in the science of fingerprint detection had solved a case that seemed all but hopeless. Uh, I feel very good about it, the fact that even though these victims were prostitutes, they were people also. And I think with his conviction, I believe that they had their day in court and justice was served. The vacuum deposition process raised Brian Jones's fingerprints and secured his conviction. But it was a computer that first singled him out. In another California case, detectives used computer technology to pursue a killer across three decades. On October 2nd, 1963, Thora Rose was spending a quiet evening alone in her apartment in Hollywood, California. She had rented the apartment just a month earlier after separating from her husband and was slowly adjusting to life on her own. Rose worked as a waitress and kept mainly to herself in her free time. The ground floor apartment was considered to be in a safe neighborhood even for a woman who lived alone. But that night, someone invaded that safety, and Thora Rose became his target. He waited in the darkness as she settled in for the evening. When her lights went out, he made his move. As Rose drifted off to sleep, he pried open a window over the kitchen sink and crawled into her apartment. Once inside, he slipped through the kitchen and crept toward the bedroom. When he got there, he attacked. After a violent struggle, Thora Rose, age 43, was dead. When Rose failed to come to work the next day, her employer telephoned her, but got no response. Concerned, he called the police. When they arrived, they found Thora Rose's body in the bedroom. Police questioned neighbors, but no one had seen anyone enter or leave Rose's apartment. Nobody heard a thing. It was one of the worst crimes the quiet Hollywood neighborhood had ever experienced. Almost 35 years later, Los Angeles police detective Mike McDonough visits the scene of the crime. Hollywood back then was a, a completely different place as it is today. I mean, when you think Hollywood back in 63, it was still the, the movie industry, um, still a lot of single family uh, residences here, a couple of apartment buildings, um, completely different world. The crime rate was practically nothing to compare to what it is to today. Hollywood now, we're averaging anywhere from 50 to 60 homicides a year. Back in 1963, they had four. The murder caused a major stir. The homicide division of the Los Angeles Police Department gave the case top priority. At first, just two detectives were assigned to the case, but the number quickly rose to six. Eventually, 32 uniformed officers and two sergeants joined the investigation. They canvassed the neighborhood for a suspect. Inside the apartment, experts dusted for fingerprints. There was palm, palm prints and fingerprints 
inside the kitchen and throughout the house. Um, there's approximately 27 fingerprints that were lifted inside the residence leading from the front window here into the bedroom. The police officers working the neighborhood found nothing. It was up to the fingerprint experts alone to solve the case. With the long trail of fingerprints left behind, the detectives were certain they would catch the murderer. Their confidence was well-founded. For more than 100 years, fingerprinting has proven to be one of the most effective ways to pin criminals to crimes. The science goes back to 1880, when Scottish physician Henry Falls suggested that ridge patterns on the fingers and hands could be useful in identifying criminals. In 1901, Scotland Yard adopted the idea, and the rest of the world soon followed. Fingerprinting works for two reasons. First, no two people share print patterns. And second, a person's fingerprints remain unchanged throughout life. The skin of human fingers and hands have raised patterns called friction ridges, which help us grip objects more firmly. They're constantly coated with a film of perspiration from tiny pores. The curves, loops, and other characteristics of the ridges can occur in billions of combinations. At a crime scene, the perpetrator may leave noticeable prints if he touched blood, grease, or another dark substance. If he touched something soft, like putty, the fingerprints may be impressed on its surface. But the majority of fingerprints are invisible, known as latent fingerprints. They're made of about 98% perspiration and 2% body oil. We leave them on virtually everything we touch. Like film in a camera, they must be developed to be seen. The fingerprint experts at Los Angeles Police Department's fingerprint lab have long relied on powders to make latent prints visible. It's been one of the most common and effective methods since fingerprinting began. When lightly applied with a camel hair brush, powder adheres to the moisture in the fingerprint, providing a finely detailed image. The detective then lifts the print using a strip of clear tape and places it on a card with his initials, the time, date, and location of the print. This detailed information is vital if the print will be used as evidence in court. After the fingerprint experts working on the Thora Rose case lifted the finger and palm prints from her Hollywood apartment, they had to prove they belonged to the perpetrator. There's always a possibility they could belong to someone else. Detectives obtained what are called elimination prints from everyone who had contact with Thora Rose. They were able to contact those people, the uh, restaurants, places she worked, they fingerprinted everyone that was there. They also went as far as local delivery boys, as far as serving, delivering chicken, mail people, um, newspaper people. Anyone that had any contact with this place, they checked out. After all other persons were eliminated, detectives drew the only possible conclusion. The prints belonged to the killer. Now they could be sent to the lab to be compared by fingerprint examiners to prints of criminals in their files. Whenever police make an arrest for even the smallest infraction, they require the arrested person to be fingerprinted. The prints are kept on file and in some cases sent to other police jurisdictions. If the suspect is ever involved in another crime, his prints will be available for comparison. The traditional way of recording fingerprints is the ink and roll method. Each finger is rolled on an ink pad, then impressed on a card with the arrested person's name and personal data. The document is then added to the fingerprint files. Recently, some jurisdictions have begun scanning fingerprints into a computer. The scanner creates a digital image of the prints so they can be added to the database. A beam of light replaces the ink pad. Either way, the matching process begins when the examiner compares prints from the crime scene 
with prints from police files. Comparing fingerprints is much the same today as in 1963. The examiner must look for matching points of identification. The friction ridges arrange themselves into arches, loops, and whorls. Sometimes they end abruptly. Sometimes they split in two. The examiner considers all these patterns when making an identification. If enough of them match, then he can be certain he's looking at the prints of the same person. In the Thora Rose case, Los Angeles detectives reviewed all the fingerprints in their files. When none matched, they sent a detective to the state capitol in Sacramento to expand the search statewide. He scoured every file, looking at a staggering 30,000 fingerprints. The labor took months, but still nothing matched. I mean, it, it's a point that they, they put in an unbelievable man hours of time on this case. And um, even with all that they have done, which is probably thousands and thousands of percent more than what we could do today with our crimes, they still weren't able to come up with anything. Even though the killer had left behind many fingerprints, the detectives couldn't match them to anyone with a police record. The case was unsolved. The files were shelved, and the murderer of Thora Rose went free. Thirty years would pass before time and technology would flush him out. Three decades after the murder of Thora Rose, a new computerized system of fingerprint comparison went online. The Automated Fingerprint Identification System, or APHIS, promised to revolutionize the field of fingerprint identification. It matches prints in a fraction of the time it took using the old method. Fingerprint examiner Donald Keir was one of the first at the Los Angeles Police Department to put APHIS to use. This fingerprint system um, it takes a time to get used to. It was new. It takes time to utilize it, and we had a lot of crimes to solve. Keir and his colleagues first used APHIS to match prints collected from current crimes against those in APHIS's files. Then they tried an experiment to see if the system could solve old cases by matching previously unmatched prints. <laughs> they chose 50 old homicide cases to test. Could APHIS breathe new life into dead cases? To find out, Keir went to the archives in the basement of the police department. There, under the dust of 30 years or more, stood shelves brimming with old fingerprint files. They were gathered from all manner of crimes, some solved, some not. One of the files he pulled contained prints from the Thora Rose murder. It was the oldest case selected. The chance of finding a suspect after almost 30 years seemed remote. But with millions of prints added to police files since 1963, and the ability of the APHIS system to compare them at lightning speed, detectives had a glimmer of hope. But first, the prints from the Rose case had to be prepared. Before APHIS can recognize any fingerprint, an examiner must photograph it at five times its normal size. In contrast to prints taken from a suspect at the police station, the ridges and patterns of most prints from a crime scene are faint and indistinct. The examiner must carefully enhance the pattern on tracing paper. Otherwise, the computer scanner will be unable to read it. Any place where I'm looping it off is where a ridge in the fingerprint pattern ends. And we want to make sure those are really clear because that's what the computer uses for a search. They're called minutia or characteristics. I check it frequently to see if I'm missing anything, go back over what I've been doing here. Where the latent print is unreadable, 
the examiner must hazard a guess as to line and detail. The tracing is scanned into the computer. The examiner cleans up any indistinct lines on the screen and identifies notable characteristics of the latent print. The computer will use these as a frame of reference. APHIS then begins the matching process. The computer looks at several areas of the unknown print. It then compares these points against prints in its database. It ranks each print according to how closely it matches the unknown print. In another room, the massive APHIS mainframe searches through millions of digitized fingerprints looking for a match. In less than an hour, it completes a job that would ordinarily take months. Then, the system delivers the closest matches. But it's up to the examiner to make the final match by eye. The prints identified by APHIS are compared side by side with the suspect's print. There can be a lot of things that match, but if you're, there's something that you know is pretty obviously a real minutia point, like this one was a pretty pretty big one right here, a little short, short line. And it looks like that might be it there, but over next to it was a place where another ridge ended. There's nothing like that over here. So I would probably disregard that one. The APHIS system has had remarkable results. During its first year of operation, San Francisco police were able to clear 816 unsolved cases, including 52 homicides. Los Angeles police hoped for similar success with their unsolved cases. They weren't disappointed. Soon after they entered the fingerprints from the Thora Rose case, APHIS made a hit. The computer produced three suspects, among them a man named Vernon Robinson. In 1963, Robinson hadn't been arrested, so his fingerprints weren't on file but he'd been arrested a number of times since then, so his prints were part of police records. Detectives using APHIS fingered him as a suspect. Detective Mike McDonough headed the new investigation. Uh, my main concern was to see if Mr. Robinson should have been there or not. I wanted to make sure that he wasn't uh, one of the detectives or a police officer at the scene, he wasn't a paramedic or that he wasn't for some reason a friend of Miss Robinson's, that fingerprints just happened to be there. When all other possibilities were eliminated, McDonough concluded that Robinson was the likely killer of Thora Rose. With that, our fingerprint people obtained the additional fingerprints, started hand searching them, physically checking the fingerprints from the crime scene against Mr. Robinson's prints, and everyone is coming right back to Mr. Robinson. I mean, at this point, there was no doubt about it. Los Angeles police tracked Robinson to Minneapolis, Minnesota, where he was now a family man with a management job in a maintenance company. He denied committing the crime, insisting that at the time of the murder, he was in San Diego at the naval base where he was stationed. But naval records indicated Robinson had completed his training by the date of the murder. His alibi was without support. Well, what swayed the jury was, I mean, the fingerprints are there. You cannot deny that. I mean, we're not talking one or two fingerprints. We're talking 20-some fingerprints. We're talking them at the point of entry through the entire house and right up to where the victim was discovered. After killing Thora Rose, Vernon Robinson managed to evade capture for almost 30 years. His life had changed, but his fingerprints remained the same. After they were matched with those from the crime scene, Robinson was convicted of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. APHIS, a phenomenal breakthrough in criminal identification, had finally obtained justice for Thora Rose. Though APHIS has dramatically improved the chances of matching fingerprints to criminals, it's useless without clear prints to work from. But crime scenes are often messy, 
and criminals don't always leave their prints in convenient spots. In a case in Vermont, a murder investigation hinged on two fragile and ill-placed prints, and one investigator's attempt to read them. On Memorial Day, 1992, Glenn Michelson had a party. He and his friends were putting the cold Vermont winter behind them and kicking off the beginning of summer. But the celebration was nearly ruined by an uninvited guest. As the party was winding down, he tried to make off in Michelson's car with one of the kegs of beer. But three of Michelson's buddies caught him in the act. They chased him off the property and retrieved the keg. With the commotion over and the keg emptied, the three men decided to continue celebrating at a nearby tavern. Michelson stayed home. The group returned to the house 45 minutes later, still in high spirits. At first, they didn't notice their host was nowhere in sight. When they called out to him, he didn't answer. They assumed he went to bed. It wasn't until one of the men noticed something peculiar in another room that the horrible truth revealed itself. A ski pole that appeared to be sticking out of the floor was actually embedded in Michelson's skull. They called the Vermont State Police, who rushed to the scene. Michelson's friends couldn't believe the friend they'd laughed with a few hours ago now lay dead. While the police made their report, detectives scoured the house for clues. Their inspection of the brutal crime scene revealed a bloody knife in the kitchen sink. It looked like the victim had been stabbed several times before the ski pole was repeatedly jabbed into his skull. According to Sergeant Miles Heffernan, the victim didn't die easily. He was uh, obviously involved in a struggle, uh, had a, a lot of blood on his clothes. There was a lot of blood on the walls in the hallway. When questioned, the three men who found the body told the detectives about the person who tried to steal Michelson's car and the beer keg. His name was Robert Plant. He'd tagged along with one of the invited guests and grew surly as the evening progressed. The men recalled he wore white shoes with pink laces, the same shoes that were found near the barefoot corpse. The cowboy boots that Michelson had worn were missing. As police continued to investigate, a call came through about a car that had run off the road less than a mile away. A neighbor named Robert Salzman made the report. Mr. Salzman uh, was in the living room with his wife and child and, and heard the car go off the road. He came out and um, observed Robert Plant uh, walking from the vehicle to the uh, front porch of Mr. Salzman's residence. He had a discussion with uh, Robert Plant. Uh, initially, uh, Plant seemed pleasant. He asked if uh, he could get a wrecker, um, and uh, Mr. Salzman was agreeable. But then, Plant became aggressive and broke a window. Salzman threw him off his property and called the police. They arrived within minutes and found the car on the side of the road. It matched the description of Glenn Michelson's vehicle, but Plant was nowhere in sight. Apparently, he fled on foot. Police searched the woods and found him in a short time, passed out under a tree. On his feet were Michelson's cowboy boots. He was taken to the station for questioning and booked for murder. On the surface, it seemed Heffernan had an open and shut case against him. 
But Plant denied the crime, and the police had no eyewitnesses. Theoretically, Plant could claim he had stolen Michelson's property after someone else committed the murder. The detectives would try to bolster their circumstantial case with forensic evidence, Plant's fingerprints. They knew prints lifted from walls, sinks, and drawers had little value since Plant had been a guest at Michelson's party. But they found bloody prints on the grip of the ski pole and on a door frame near the body. If these prints could be identified as Robert Plant's, police would clinch their case. To help him make the identification, Heffernan called on fingerprint expert John Creighton of the Vermont Department of Public Safety's forensic lab. Because the prints were etched in the victim's dried blood, they were extremely incriminating and extremely fragile. Traditional methods of dusting with powder would not be effective. Fortunately, Creighton has a well-stocked arsenal with the means to recover difficult prints. How a print is raised depends on the kind of surface it's on. Uh, basically, there's two different types of evidence that come into the lab for fingerprinting. There's porous and non-porous evidence. Uh, the porous evidence is papers and cardboards and things of that nature, and the non-porous evidence is wood, uh, plastics, metal, glass, things of that nature. Uh, so depending on what type of evidence it is, will dictate what type of examination you do. Paper and other porous surfaces leave no moisture for powders to cling to. One classic method for raising prints from these surfaces is iodine fuming. Iodine crystals are placed inside a glass tube. The tube is then packed with fiberglass and copper sulfate. Breath passing through the crystals heats them, creating fumes. When the fumes reach the fingerprints, the iodine reacts with fatty oils, making them visible. A drawback of this method is that the prints will disappear in about 20 minutes when the iodine evaporates. They must be photographed after fuming, so police will have a record of them. Another way to find fingerprints on paper is to spray the surface with a chemical called ninhydrin. Uh, ninhydrin is a spray or a compound that reacts to amino acids that are present in eccrine and sebaceous sweat deposited latent prints. The ninhydrin is sprayed onto porous material and is then catalyzed or the reaction is catalyzed by applying heat and moisture, uh, generally by means of an iron. Uh, this develops the prints much more quickly. Uh, otherwise, you'd have to set them in the dark and wait uh, anywhere from 24 to possibly 72 hours for any latent impressions to develop that way. Because the amino acids in fingerprints take a long time to disappear, ninhydrin has been used to develop latent prints as old as 15 years. Superglue has also become a staple of fingerprint examiners. Technically called cyanoacrylate ester, it's used on non-porous surfaces, like plastic, where fragile prints could be easily brushed away when powders are applied. Superglue is often used for developing prints inside a car. The glue is poured into a small container and heated. The car is closed up tightly. As the glue is heated, its fumes adhere to the moisture in latent fingerprints and fixes them in place. The examiner can then use traditional powders without the danger of destroying the print. The Glenn Michelson case posed a different set of problems. The bloody thumbprint on the doorframe near the victim's body was barely visible and too delicate to lift. Creighton asked detectives to remove the section of door frame bearing the print and send it to him so he could examine it in a more controlled environment. Creighton's job was to make the print on the door frame distinct without ruining it. 
he could then compare it with Robert Plant's. First, he took photographs, so he would have a record of the evidence before the procedure. Items of evidence are photographed uh, before any physical or chemical development uh, takes place in order to recover and preserve any existing latent detail that is present on the item. Uh, afterwards, uh, then we can do the various processes that are applied to developing the latent impression on that item. Creighton sprayed the door frame with a stain called amido black. The chemical reacts with blood, darkening the print and making it easier to identify. The amido black is a protein stain. It stains the protein that is within the blood itself. So when the ridges or the outline of the impression on the finger is deposited in the blood, the amido black is going to make that impression darker. Uh, it allows it to have more contrast uh, with the background. Bloody fingerprints are very fragile in most cases, so they can't be lifted with tape without destroying them, even after they're developed with amido. Instead, Creighton photographed the enhanced print. When he compared it to plants, it matched. But Plant could have touched the blood-stained doorframe after someone else committed the crime. And the evidence against Plant must convince a jury of his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The irrefutable evidence in the murder of Glenn Michelson had yet to be processed. Glenn Michelson had been the victim of a callous murder, a ski pole driven through his skull. Robert Plant was the prime suspect, but could detectives tie him to the crime? The answer rested on a bloody palm print left on the grip of the weapon. To identify the print, John Creighton needed to photograph it. First, he'd have to make it more visible. That was easier said than done. Uh, the big dilemma was it was a black ski pole grip and it was a dark reddish brown blood impression that was deposited on that. Now what I had to do was I had to improve the contrast either by lightening the background of the black ski pole grip or by um, lightening the blood impression itself. Creighton lit the print with a poly light, a lamp that can project a wide spectrum of wavelengths. The light produced enough contrast to photograph the print. But Creighton faced a second problem. The curvature of the grip prevented the camera lens from keeping the entire print in focus. I had to keep rotating the ski pole grip in order to come up with enough characteristics within the pattern area or within the latent impression that would give me enough information to make an identification. By manipulating the grip, Creighton was able to get a clear photograph of the print. After it was processed, he compared the print to plants. It matched. Creighton had placed the murder weapon firmly in Plant's hand. The events of Glenn Michelson's final hours now made sense. Detectives believed that after being kicked off Michelson's property, Plant hid in the darkness and waited for an opportunity to sneak back into the house. Once the guests had left, he saw his chance and made his move. He slipped into the kitchen and rummaged around until he found a knife. As he stepped into the hallway, Michelson spotted him. The two men struggled, but Plant had the fatal advantage. He stabbed Michelson repeatedly until he brought the victim down. He removed Michelson's boots and put them on his own feet. 
Then he realized his victim wasn't dead. So he found a ski pole in another room and returned to finish him off. As he thrust the pole, he put his hand on the doorframe for support. After the final blow, he left the house, stealing Michelson's car for his getaway. But he only made it about a mile before he ran off the road. The bloody prints that Creighton analyzed gave Detective Miles Heffernan the evidence he needed to convict Robert Plant. It was very compelling, uh, very compelling for a jury when they hard to explain or, or explain away. You've got your thumbprint uh, in the victim's blood on the door molding, and you've got the handprint on the murder weapon. Uh, it tells a story right there. For the murder of Glenn Michelson, Robert Plant received a sentence of 50 years to life. For more than a century, fingerprints have proven themselves a reliable and irrefutable way to link criminals to their crimes. In the next century, their role will increase as scientists improve ways to recover them. More and more, killers will be delivered into the arms of justice by their own hands. Thank you.